Greetings, foolhardy viewers who have made the rash decision to attend our discussion of Robert W. Chambers' The King in Yellow, a book about a book that drives its readers insane. I'm Robert Gibson, alias Zendexor, and my teammates on this madcap enterprise are Nikita Zueff and XJ. Together, um, we shall focus on the book's first tale called The Repairer of Reputations, though if we survive the experience long enough, we may also tackle some of the others. Published in 1895, the story begins with a survey of what the author imagines will be the political and social situation in the year 1920. One of its features is official support for voluntary euthanasia, the first government lethal chamber being set up in New York where the story begins. After a few pages of this interesting Wellesian style future history, the tale becomes personal. And we suddenly get the first of many indications that our narrator, a chap called Hildred Castain, is not all there. He informs us that after a fall from his horse, he was obliged to undergo treatment for insanity by Dr. Archer, whom he doesn't forgive for that diagnosis. After the doctor unwisely decides that he's recovered, I quote, I told him smiling that I would get even with him and he laughed heartily and asked me to call once in a while. I did so hoping for a chance to even up accounts, but he gave me none and I told him I would wait. We're left in no doubt that while Dr. Archer thinks that Castain is joking, the truth is more sinister. It's not just that Castain has suffered a knock on the head when he fell from his horse. During his convalescence, he experiences a worse misfortune which sends his mind permanently over the edge, namely a shock of reading The King in Yellow. From that moment on, as he shares his thoughts with the reader, Castain piles up the evidence against himself with ever-increasing dramatic irony. Castain is friends with a fellow reader of the accursed book. This man named Wilde is a blackmailer, the repairer of reputations of the story's title. Wilde is probably as insane as Castain and even more outwardly eccentric, but also seems to have some real psychic ability, evinced when he manages to locate a missing part of a suit of armour which an expert armourer could not find. Whatever the truth of Wilde's claims, including the claim to be at the head of a huge conspiracy to gain power, Castain sees in this connection, in accordance with hints he derives from The King in Yellow, his chance to become King of America. At one point, he is trying on his golden jeweled crown, and his sane cousin named Louis happens to catch him at it and says, Come, come, old fellow, take off that brass crown. Are you going to a masquerade? What's all this theatrical tinsel anyway? Castain bottles up his rage on that occasion, but his control is starting to slip. The final scene explodes into an inferno of the narrator's obsessions and delusions, terrifyingly displayed to the reader from the viewpoint of Castain's insane mind. Seeing Louis as a contender for his crown, Castain demands that he renounce it. Louis humours him, but Castain then announces that he has cut Dr. Archer's throat and has arranged the death of Louis's fiancée, Constance. In truth, what he had actually done was to get Wilde to coerce one of his blackmail victims, called Vance, to agree to murder Constance. Now, when just at that moment he sees the miserable Vance rushing to the government lethal chamber, he assumes that this is out of remorse and that the deed is done. However, when the appalled Louis rushes home, it turns out that Constance is still alive, and we realise that Vance must have chosen death as a way of freeing himself from Wilde. Wilde himself is found dead, killed by the feral cat he keeps baiting. 
The police are summoned and close in on the shrieking narrator, and a final editorial note tells us that Castain died yesterday in the Asylum for the Criminally Insane. So there we are, a uh, cheerful story. I will now ask uh, Nikki Zuif uh, to kick off with the uh, comments. Of course. Well, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak first. I would describe this story as a giant barrel of uh, sweet honey uh, that you get lost in. As soon as you see it you and open it up, you know, it captures you, encapsulates you, the golden nectar within the barrel glistening from the sun. And the more you get into what's going on, the more this viscous structure of the honey takes you until you're completely enveloped, almost trapped within the story itself. This is probably one of the best horror uh, short stories that I've ever read. Maybe the best one. I'm not really sure. Uh, it, it uses very interesting methods in order to get us closer to the action. In fact, it gets us so worried about everybody else in the story than the protagonist. It's actually astonishing. Usually, an author creates a situation in which the protagonist has a peril or uh, that he has to fight against or a titular antagonist they have to defeat or a situation they have to get out of. Here it's the opposite. We want this guy to stop. We want this pseudo king to be caught. And the more we learn about him, the more we're like, no, this cannot be. This is crazy, right? This Somebody has to stop this guy. You know, at first you're kind of on his side. You're like, oh man, you had an accident. Yeah, you had to go to a psychic word. Mm, yeah, that sucks. Yeah, really. Say, oh, especially that you're, you know, because at the beginning you believe him. This is exactly what I felt was missing from they, for example, where you know I I I got the expectations subverted here, uh, exactly. Where in there I was from the start thinking, okay, this is gonna end with the protagonist being right. Here, on the other hand, um, Chambers is capable of first making me feel like I want to be on this. Uh, on this protagonist's side and then slowly but surely he makes me feel or he makes the reader feel so to speak i hope i hope everyone else uh, experienced the same thing uh this utter disgust for hildred and the nausea mm. that he creates the creeping anger that constantly comes out of him the madness that cannot be stopped um i think the the story really sold me uh on itself uh with this passage uh, that i'd like to read i climbed the three dilapidated flights of stairs which i had so often climbed before and knocked at a small door at the end of the corridor Mr. Wilde opened it and walked in. When he had double locked the door, a uh, double locked the door and pushed a heavy chest against it, he came and sat down beside me, peering up into my face with his little light colored eyes. Half a dozen new scratches covered his nose and cheeks, and the silver wires which supported his artificial ears had become displaced. I thought I had never seen him so hideously fascinating. He had no ears. The artificial ones, which now stood out at an angle from the fine wire, were his one weakness. They were made of wax and painted a shell pink, but the rest of his face was yellow. He might better have reveled in the luxury of some artificial fingers for his left hand, which was absolutely fingerless. But it seemed to cause him no inconvenience, and he was satisfied with the wax ears. He was very small, scarily, higher than a child of ten, but his arms were magnificently, uh, magnificently developed, 
and his thighs as thick as an athlete's. Still, the most re remarkable thing about Mr. Wilde was that the man of his marvelous intelligence and knowledge should have such a head that is flat and pointed like the heads of many of those unfortunates whom people imprison in asylums for the weak-minded. Many called him insane, but I knew him to be as sane as I was. Mm. And from that point on, as soon as he compared himself to Mr. Wilde, I knew we had a terrible team of villains uh, on our side. One that could uh, go out into the outwardly world and inherit the kingdom and the other staying in the shadows, creating horrible plots to make sure that his master gets his wish. And the whole story about this book that turns you mad and makes uh, people do terrible things once you read it, the forbidden knowledge that explains the universe. I guess I know what H.P. Lovecraft was reading before he started writing. Mm. This was published in 1856, right? Somewhere around there. Or was it a bit uh, later it than that? first published in the 1890s, 1895. Uh, nine, ah, 1895, yeah, 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 1895. Mm -hmm. I was, for some reason, I was thinking of Pushkin's work, 1856. Uh, yeah, 1895, yes, correct. So that is um, full, almost 30 years uh, before Lovecraft ever put anything on paper. That's, man... Mm. really there, there's so many things that i want to talk about when it comes to this story that i think i just have to kind of stop for a second and uh, let xj uh, say his piece but i will say one more thing for me the story proves one simple thing and that is you don't have to have a very a very elaborate plot or huge twists in order to keep suspense in a story even a short one. All you need is an intrigue, one that puts at risk those within the story. And if you can tell that really well, it really doesn't matter what the stakes are that people will be reading. Hmm. There you go. Really, really enjoyed um, Mr. Chambers' debut on our podcast. Uh, actually, what did you think about the story? Oh, where do I even start, man? This this story is a doozy. If I'm going to borrow your analogy of a honey, I would say it's maybe uh, that hallucinatory honey from Nepal or Bhutan or something like that. You take it. Ah, ma mad go, honey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You take it and you go on a trip. <laughs> um, so first of all, uh, is it's the story itself is difficult to describe, but also there is a there is a matter around the story um that is unavoidable just because it's been published uh for so many years now uh more than a century ago so the king in yellow as uh robert had described is a collection of short stories repair of reputations is the first the first five stories in this collection are loosely connected to each other the king in yellow is himself a person, and then he he appears within uh, this these stories. They get mentioned. The problem is that I've only read the repair of reputation, so whatever I say about the repair of reputations might not carry over to the rest of the stories. So there's that caveat. Uh, that said, sometimes we have to go boldly go forth where even wise men fear to tread and that is to be wrong on the internet um <laughs> <laughs> oh, very good uh like nikki i think this is a terrific horror story it is probably better than lovecraft in my opinion it is the the sense of dread and uneasiness it evokes is uh in my opinion better than anything lovecraft had managed even with his very powerful description of cthulhu and all the eldritch abominations it is and there's a there, there are some 
reasons why this particular story succeeds. Now, um, usually in my case, I read a story first and then I go to find out more things about it. And in Wikipedia, it says that the repair of reputations, the style in which it's written is, is something that, is, that will come to be known as a, a kind of anti-fiction. Um, in which the author breaks one of the few implicit uh, contracts between author and reader. And in this case, it is that the author, what the author tells the reader is not true. So, so in a sense, we are not just dealing with an unreliable nar narrator here. We are dealing also with an unreliable author. And at to... If, if it's just this, that uh, if it's just like, uh, I mean, there is a there is a there is a certain elegance to the way uh, Chambers wrote his story, though, and that is this very slow drip feeding of the sense of wrongness around the story. I don't think it would have worked otherwise, uh, and I think I have to go back to the beginning um, so the the I think uh, as 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 we have uh, as Robert has said um, the story is published in 1890 the 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 scenario the world scenario in 1920 was is totally fictional um, but it is, it, but the way it's written is like it's very matter of fact. It's very casual. It, it's written in a way that, um, it's almost as if the reader, uh, is expected to know all these things, and and the author is just casually describing certain events and skipping over a lot of details, and that is a very powerful way of. Uh, drawing the reader in to to think about the um, the situation now as, uh, as 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 the story goes on we find out that the doc uh, that he had fallen off from a horse the narrator Hildred it's Hildred right um, Hildred yeah yeah Hildred fell off from a horse and was uh, diagnosed with uh, insanity and was put in an asylum and we all know at that time the asylums were quite terrible um, uh, and during his convalescence he read The King in Yellow now at this point all we know about The King in Yellow is that the book had been banned in France and not just banned but uh, apparently the French government had seized every single copy of it and the book was described to spread like an infectious disease from city to city, continent to continent. Now, that's a really interesting way to, to uh, describe a book. And then when, um, when uh, the narrator pass, passes by the armor, Hallbrook, uh, and he, like the suicide chamber is also a very odd thing. But I think for me, where it starts where the entire story, the reality of the story starts coming apart is when he visited Holbrook and then he was, uh, uh, I don't know, man. He, he, apparently he really likes the sound of the armor going ting, ting, ting. And then he can sit there for days just listening <laughs> to that thinking. And I'm like, that is such an odd thing. Uh, and here, here, he uh, the 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 very sinister nature of Hildred just starts creeping in from this point on because he talks about uh, how he how the daughter of Hallberg, uh Constance is in love with his cousin Louis and how and he's very casually saying it doesn't bother him but it keeps him up at night and he resolves to himself that one day he needs to he needs to talk to his uh uh he will how 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 did the story put it he will arrange the future the same way he would arrange the future of his doctor and how was the narrator going to arrange the future of the doctor he was going to get even 
that stuff like this just starts creeping in from here and then he he decides to pay a visit to to wild and and um nikki just kind of uh robbed me of my opportunity to read out the same passage <laughs> because it is so beautiful right <laughs> like the description of wild is just like crazy it's wild it's missing an ear the head is flat and uh, ba the description is basically somebody who is physically deformed at birth and and people like that with a misshapen skull they tend to be simpletons and they are usually i don't know if they're demented but they're definitely lacking in the in cognitive ability but then the narrator insists that wild has some sort of psychic power and and he proves it because he talked he 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 told Horbuck where to find a piece of armor he had been looking for for a long time claims that Horbuck is actually the marquis of avonshire implies mm. that he is that marquis of Avon, avonshire and uh the reaction of Horbuck kind of kind of implies that he 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 is the Marquis of Avonshire. So there is something to 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 wild. Uh, but but is it really wild? Because we're also dealing with a with a with a with an unreliable author here. Because like when we when we when we actually go into the scene with um, where our Hildred first meets Wild, it's a it 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 is it's like a scene from godfather he's sitting there and he's saying you know we got we got the hooks on this guy he i can get him to do this and do that and it it's all very dark very uh, gritty um uh and the the repair of reputation is like i mean even the the title just sounds really sinister <laughs> Mm. And I have a, I, I mean, I have a lot of notes, man, and it's all just like jumbled up it, because the story is so difficult. I think you know what? I think I've been going on for too long, so I will just say that uh, what really works in this story is for me anyway is a s very slow drip feeding of the uh, of the sense of wrongness, like. Like everything starts out sort of okay. And then little little bits starts creeping in, like how he's gonna get even with settle the future of uh of his cousin and then the 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 dialogue with uh Wild and and then bringing in all sorts of weird things like what was the thing that he keeps referring to? Cascor? Um Mm, it's all very mysterious Car that yeah carcosa carcosa Car yeah so yeah. here's here's the other thing um if you own the book and not just read a pdf document from uh uh um, the gutenberg library uh the there is a short there we go there is a short poem about carcosa right in the beginning if i'm not wrong mm. yeah and so so the uh hildred keeps referring to to this uh strange places carcosa um and bunch of hardest the lake of harley the uh uh where else uh, well the higher days of higher days of haster the lake of harley and he keeps raving about the yellow sign it's all very mysterious very strange and and so i think before i hand it back to robert the thing that made me wonder whether uh um hildred is actually talking to it, like it, whether hildred is actually having uh is having an actual dialogue with wild or he's talking to himself is because when um when Horberg actually did find the piece of armor, right where uh, Wild claimed it would be, 
uh, he offered to give a uh, reward to 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 wild and uh, and uh, Hildred got very angry he he was so upset he was like why it's like why would uh, why would uh, wild need money uh, and he doesn't want the credit and he and I just can't get over the fact why is he so angry on wild's behalf it's as if he knows he knows him very intimately like they are the same person so that's why i was like you know and i keep going on and on he was going to tear open uh he was going to tear open uh he taught he he got vans he blackmailed vans to go uh cut uh john archer's throat his doctor right mm. but apparently wild also died it's he we the narrator thinks it's the cat that killed him but he also described his throat being cut so who who really got killed mm. okay anyway yeah i i i love this story it's so delicious if you're a big fan of weird lovecraftian uh stories and uh uh just like really out there kind of stories bizarre stories this can't do any better than this okay back to, <laughs> back to robert mm. yeah the unreliable narrator theme actually lovecraft did use it himself in one story well unreliable i don't know if you say unreliable it's not quite in the same way but in a story called the temple the narrator is a u-boat commander mm. and he's uh uh, it's written in a very a style full of dramatic irony like like this one um but anyway a couple of further points um the uh thing about wanting to be king of of america there was a chap called joshua abraham norton uh, who actually did claim to be Emperor of the United States in 1859. He lived in San Francisco, and the, the Californians just loved it. They really lapped it up. They gave this guy all the support they could, and uh, I think they gave him free meals and all that. They just loved having the Emperor of the United States living in San Francisco. Um, and that's um, that's right he got didn't he like uh um there was some riots and he basically coordinated the streets and got the people together or something like that at some point um, did yeah, he become town be. hero could be so anyway it's not beyond imagining that maybe chambers adapted that theme in his in his story uh makes me wonder if perhaps you know i could if i get hard up i could perhaps do something like that Anyway, um, so uh, another point I want to say in praise of the story is that Castain, Hildred Castain, although uh, two sandwiches short of a picnic, you know, he nevertheless, he writes in a very, or he narrates in a very disciplined way, uh, because if the story had been um, written in a crazy style about a crazy person, then that would have been one craziness too many. We are treated to a very lucid account of the, the chap's mad um, delusions. That's very effectively done. Um, the uh, other point I want to make is regarding the introduction, the, the few pages of objective introduction, I that's one of the things I remembered most from the story which I read a long time ago and I really like this futuristic vision of the year 1920 I found it fascinating sort of H.G. Wells type uh, guesswork you know wouldn't have wanted it to really happen that way obviously all these uh, lethal chambers and so on but it was, it was interesting and it's written in a sort of congratulatory style, let's say, aren't we advanced nowadays, which one can imagine Wells 
uh, Wells himself writing about things like that. So it sounds like a, it sounds like commentary on something that was going on at the time. Yeah. Where someone was saying, "Oh, we're are we doing something humane?" Where in reality it was just very terrible for the public. Which mm. seems to be a move like that, right? Where yeah. oh, we are so humane, we're allowing people to do the most terrible thing to themselves that they ever could, you know, end their existence. Yeah, of course, if they all start reading The King in Yellow, then maybe it's a good idea to have the uh, <laughs> lethal chambers handy. Um, which brings me to the final, my final point, which is that this idea of a book that drives its readers mad, as far as I know, it's unique in, in horror literature. The only thing I can think analogous to it is the myth of the Gorgon in... in uh, ancient times of course there it's not a book you read it's a face you look at um, but it's actually, the same thing. actually I think uh, when I when when I read the description of the king in yellow the first thing that came to mind was the Necronomicon actually right. the, the, the book of sorcery written by the mad mage what's his name in, Mad Arab Ar Abdul Al Hazred, yes, yes, in in Lovecraft, and mm. and I was wondering like maybe Lovecraft stole more than just the style from uh, Chambers. Well, I mean the ne Necronomicon, it was written by somebody mad. It doesn't actually send the readers mad. It may introduce them to highly unwise areas of reality. Uh, which would be best left undisturbed, but it's not the same thing as the King in Yellow at all. I mean, it's a the concept of a book that is so dangerous. I think is what I was focusing on. Yeah, yeah it's dangerous, all right. Yeah, a very very yeah. dangerous book, apparently. Yeah, but I'd rather I'd rather, yeah. My, I think my insurance company would would be happier if I read the Necronomicon than if I read the King in Yellow. <laughs> That's fair enough. What uh, if the insurance that depends if the insurance companies feel so, then it must be right. Yeah. Uh, that depends if you signed with them before or after reading. Mm. <laughs> if you're reading out, if you were doing it after the reading, they'd love for you to read the King in Yellow, I think. Yeah, I suppose so. All right. Why don't we compare what we think the sequence of events actually is and what the truths and lies are for us? I'll start. So I think Hildred um, took a really bad fall and actually that really jostled his head and he was crazy, right? And he was in this asylum for a very long time. And uh, the reason that everyone is so nice to him is because they are aware of his rage. So much so that that was kind of like, that's the problem. He just became constantly angry after his fall. And that's why everyone is treating him so nicely and letting him get away with all these things. Um, I also think that Mr. Wilde is using Hildred. I think Hil uh, Wilde is the mastermind. And Hildred is just a pawn who has been given a crown because of his blood. Uh, and this idea of the, the king in yellow... Uh, that 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 is like perpetrated through the story. I also haven't read anything else in Chambers' repa uh, repertoire, so I have no idea what happens next. If you're saying the stories are loosely connected, afterwards, you know, I'd love to see it. But I think Mr. Wild, you know, he is part of some kind of a network that's maybe even worldwide, because the author really focuses through his world building. That there's a lot of other places where this book has been. So I think Wilde is trying to do something in America, and there's some kind of a Mr. Wilde in France, there's some kind of a Mr. Wilde in England, one in Russia, one in Saudi Arabia, right? Like, they're all kind of like helping each other to achieve this goal. So like, all right, we've got the king of America. He's gonna run this stuff for us. What are we gonna do next? I, you know, that's kind of where my head was going. Um, and I also think that the the story really lets itself but well, i don't know i think it really shows itself to be 
that not only is what Hildred is saying lies, but they are understandable lies. They're not out of this world lies. They're small little lies that really change the narrative. Right? I don't think that the like I think the sequence of events that's transpired in the story did happen. Just maybe just slightly differently. At least mm. that's the way I saw it. Mm. What about you, Robert? How do you see this sequence of events? Uh, broadly, I agree with you. The, the big mystery for me is um, I'm not sure what happened to Dr. Archer. Uh, I'm not sure if he really did uh, kill, stab to death Dr. Archer or if he just thought he did. I, I'm not sure. I don't think that was a um business of wilds i think that was if he if he did kill dr archer i i got the impression that it was hildred who did it uh without like any personally mm. yeah mm. it was <laughs> supposed in the story itself uh it was uh wild who blackmailed this guy called vance to go kill not just go kill the doctor but also to try to kill louis and constance I got the impression it was just to kill Constance. Uh... Louis, Louis will be killed if he does not renounce the crown. Yeah, well, and he did renounce it. That's he, the thing. He, he renounced the crown, but he is still with Constance. So yeah. in, in Hildred's mind, uh, Louis did not, did not yeah. re re renounce the crown. Yeah. So... So, uh, but I'm interrupting Robert. Please go ahead. No, well, I interrupted. I was just, I was just supporting what you were saying. I was saying he, he still wanted to kill Constance because uh, they might produce an heir. So even if Louis had renounced the crown, you know, this is the paranoia, as you were saying, the paranoia taking place. And also... Uh, to add to this whole doctor situation, it's not very clear that anyone was actually murdered. I mean, Hildred is thinking mm. that someone was murdered, but Constant mm. comes out more or less unscathed, right? And he sees Hildred being taken. Mm. Well, that's so only maybe, uh, yeah, only because Wild killed himself rather than commit the murder, I think. Correct. If we believe, so like this is, you know, now now it's getting out of hand a little bit. If we believe that Wilde is a real person, right, and not just somebody that uh, Hilda has come up with and is himself, right. But then that would contradict a couple of things uh, in the story too. But that's kind of the problem with a narrative, narrative where you can, you know, the author basically tells you, pick it apart because this guy's crazy and you can't trust him. Right. I mean, I have to go back to what I said. You can't actually trust the author either. Because this is a style written. It, it's an anti-fiction. Uh, supposedly, it's an anti-fiction. Mm -hmm. the, the author breaks certain contracts that is implicit between the author and the reader. And in this case, the author himself is not telling you the truth. So, so... It, it's why this story really works because not only is the narrator himself extremely unreliable, but you can't, you can't really uh, trust what the author says either. It's a very experimental story. Uh, the style is very, very experimental. Uh, but it's one of those experiments that really, really worked. Mm. And again, yeah. like I said, he 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 wanted Vance to go cut uh, uh, the doctor's throat, but the thing is, the only person that, according to the author, the only person that got his throat cut was Wild. Like no one else was. Had <laughs> it's like it's like re so. What's really going on here? Is Vance even a real person? But we know, but we know Wilde is a real person because Hallberg saw Wilde, because Hallberg and Constance know that Wilde is there, right? And Hallberg, in the, in the section where Hallberg was uh, trying to, to, to was, was uh, telling um, Hildred that he wants to give um, 
uh, while the the reward for finding the armor because he thinks it's, it should be his by right because he he did tell him where to find the armor uh, he also described while that's coming down and nailing the sign uh, the repair of reputation right over his uh, hallway it's like clearly wild is a real person he is at, at least sane and cognitive enough to actually do certain things like putting up a sign but uh he is also the only one that got killed that we know of that is actually described as being dead uh, by a cat which is really strange but the death blow was a sliced throat so Mm. <laughs> maybe the cat read the king in yellow <laughs> Could be. Mm. the cat strikes me as being very clever too mm. Mm. that whole mm. you know that whole companionship that wild and, and the cat have it must be some sort of a metaphor for something it has to be there has to be some hidden meaning behind that whole that whole description of what who knows and what he was doing with the cat who knows yeah. now i haven't Maybe. been able to find anything uh, myself but i'm just someone smarter than me has written a thesis about mr wild and his cat. possibly possibly i mean like i'm really keen to read the rest of uh the stories that have in the king and yellow that are connected to each other because what i understand is after the after the first few stories the rest are just straight out romance uh, yeah. stories well i've i've read all of the king and yellow stories a long time ago and i have to say that the repairer of reputations is the one that stuck in my mind much more i can't remember anything about any of the other any of the other king and yellow stories uh, that's kind of sad yeah but yeah, it could... is, because we have read the best, haven't we, if that's the case? Well, you don't know. I mean, it could be that in those long-distant days, I wasn't uh, clever enough to understand the other ones properly and or appreciate them properly. We just don't know. We just don't know. I think, I think uh, for me, like, um, for this particular story, I have to just take it on its own. It's, yeah. it's not something that is that lends itself to it to very properly to an analysis because there is just so much going on here i think i think i can i i do remember that there isn't any real resolution of the mystery in the other stories they're all equally inconclusive as far as what the heck is this King book really i yeah. would be i would be extraordinarily disappointed if there was a resolution Hmm. Because well, I think in, we can speak easy on that point. Yeah, it, yeah. In uh, in my experience, a uh, mystery that is unresolved uh, tends to stay powerful. Let's put it that way. Hmm. Yeah. A good author can write a good mystery that can be resolved, though. And hmm. uh, what's it called? I I would love a resolution to know what what the hell is going on with the King in Yellow book. Well, it's very different. I guess uh, I guess uh, I would be not disappointed, and you would be, unfortunately. Mm. It might be best not to know, really. Yeah. Well, who knows? We might see, go that's mad. the problem. We might go mm. mad if we knew the truth. Yeah. Well, you. Can. I mean, one hopes. <laughs> uh, you know, Robert. I. You know, I would. I would be the type of guy that would be like, "Oh, this is a forbidden book. You don't. Don't want to read it." it this is the secret set of the universe. I'd already be flipping it. You know? mm. They've, they've mm. just told me, oh, you can't read this. I'm already like on page five. I'm starting to remember other books, which they don't exactly have the same idea, but there's a book called Macroscope by Piers Anthony, uh, which has a machine called the Macroscope, which is set up a bit like you can imagine it as a sort of super Hubble space telescope, but employed using different radiation, not electromagnetic. And you can actually see 
other worlds from from close by if you look through the macroscope and there's a point where you can't look beyond a certain distance i think it is or you can't understand beyond a certain point what you're seeing because there's a signal that has been put up by some interstellar power called the destroyer and if you uh look too analytically or too closely or with too much intelligence the destroyer reaches out and blows your mind um presumably because the dis whoever built the destroyer didn't want macroscopes prying into their culture uh, but anyway that that's a bit like a book that blows your mind if you read it um, i can i can recommend macroscope it's it's a good book um i'm reminded by one of the quotes from from uh the repair of reputations i pray god will curse the writer as the writer has cursed the world with his beautiful stupendous creation terrible in its simplicity irresistible in its truth a word a world which now trembles before the king in yellow um mm -hmm. i'd love to do we ever meet the king in yellow does he ever show up is he like hello guys no, Yellow no. King here. No, no, no? I'm pretty sure not. No. Boo! <laughs> Boo! All right. Did anybody write continuation to the King in Yellow? Like, oh, did Chambers himself uh, write anything after those short uh, four short stories? I think uh, so. No, no. The rest of the the rest of the short stories in the King in Yellow are all romance stories. Yes, I know. You, I've heard that. Uh, from you already yes actually i'm saying after the book basically right. he's just stuck to writing romance I, I believe yeah yeah he died in 1933 it says here after write, um, writing historical romances and it, it lists a few of them yeah um, he, he just stuck to writing romance stories mm. so there we are so he died four years before lovecraft did that's yeah. how close together they were. Yeah. That's crazy. Well, yeah. I I suppose they were contemporaries. Mm. Are they? They were. Yeah. Kinda. I mean, you see, Lovecraft was born in 1890. So he was born f five years before this book was published. Mm. So it would be more accurate to say that Lovecraft probably grew up reading this, but uh, Lovecraft died early. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I think I think every yeah. Lovecraft type of horror is different from this one. It's a Lovecraft Lovecraft's horror is when it is horror, not science fiction, uh, is kind of role playing horror. You sort of you sort of enjoy the uh, participating in this shuddersome experience of reading it. Whereas the King in Yellow is different. The King in Yellow actually can get really scary. At least the idea can get really scary. I mean, the the way I would describe it is uh, the difference between the Japanese version of the ring and the Hollywood version of the of the ring. It, it, I wouldn't that, quite that, that go that far. That comparison is doing a little bit of injustice to Lovecraft. I admit, but but what I'm trying to say is that is that the King in Yellow works on a different level. It works on a much deeper level. Just because mm. how of how disconnected everything is from each uh, from everything else, or at least the repair of reputations. I don't know what the other stories are like. Mm. Mind you, if if you presented me with a choice of having a new undiscovered work by Chambers and a new undiscovered work by Lovecraft, I would choose the Lovecraft one every time. My pulse <laughs> would start racing because uh, I don't know it's just that. It's not a matter of who scares you the most. It's a matter of who enlarges your imagination the most. Lovecraft, Lovecraft had the uh, truly out there ideas. Nothing really crazy happens in the story. It is good tension, but there's mm. no monsters. There's no otherworldly insane thing that we actually go into detail. One of the one of the reasons, uh, probably the reason why I love Lovecraft's work and what's clearly missing here and why I was asking if the king in yellow or anything like that shows up uh, later 
is is the cosmic is the yeah. thing that makes lovecraft lovecraft I mean, well this has the feel of I mean, uh, a story like that could i finish um then in in lovecraft what is elevated is the terrible descriptions like in dunwich horror right that was a crazy one i mean that's that's pretty much why i made the comparison uh to between the two versions of the ring because lovecraft actually did describe show you what the horrors are which i i give him full credit for it's a very brave thing to do and uh and uh uh, uh it, it it and he also did it quite masterfully the difference between the difference between uh the king in yellow and i mean the king in yellow does have an eldritch horror here too the king in yellow himself you know he, he chambers didn't go didn't develop the king in yellow uh but it's 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 what it's again it 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 it, it is the difference between the Japanese version of the the ring and the Hollywood version of the ring because the Japanese version of the ring they never really they never really relied on showing you what the horror is they just implied what the horror is and then the the psychological stress just keeps building it's a different sort of thing and in my mind if you want to be disturbed and you just want to walk around the whole day feeling like somebody uh uh crossed your grave or something like that then the king in yellow is what you need to read yeah mm. yeah to me it's a difference between not uh, style i mean there is stylistic differences yes but uh, the reason that I would pick Lovecraft over over uh, Chambers' work, um, simply because I think if you're gonna do something with the within the Eldritch uh, genre, and you show it, to me, you uh, you may not be better, but you're definitely braver. And if you're brave, that means that once or maybe many times but at least once you're gonna do it right and you're gonna do it so well that i'm gonna be reading this description and i'm gonna imagine it however this idea of like no description and just kind of uh you know implying it not showing it at all that gets old really fast and the more you use it in your stories the more i'm gonna be like all right chambers is being chambers again no, uh, you be. I I wonder what your reaction will be. Uh, actually, let's find out. The reason why Chambers stopped working on on the King in Yellow, uh, well, stopped writing about the King in Yellow, is because the mm-hmm. romance stories made him more money. Oh yeah, I mean, obviously, <laughs> right? Yeah, I mean, so, why? So it basically, basically, uh. He he didn't really uh, develop the King in Yellow uh, because uh, it just wasn't making him that much money. Mm-hmm. Right, but, that, was, but that's yeah, not what I was talking about. Yeah, that. sorry, go on, Robert. We, 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 they couldn't. They couldn't hear you, Robert. Didn't have that option. Uh, you can't. You can't imagine Lovecraft writing romance stories. I mean, he. he just... <laughs> I could. <laughs> I don't think they'd be very good. <laughs> you know. This poor introvert living with his mother. <laughs> All I he asked for friends, uh, I mean, pen pals, and his cats. I mean, the. I don't think I don't think there is. Uh, so first of all, I think like uh, Chambers is with the King in Yellow. He's trying to do something experimental, and you can't really and and to be honest, when I read the story, it really it really felt like watching one of those uh, old uh, avant garde movies uh from back in the in the early 19th century uh 8, 8, 20th century and like in ingmar bergman and all that it's just really bizarre really out there really disconnected and it is some of those 
avant-garde movies are very very creepy but mm. they usually are one shots and they don't um, they don't uh, uh, last beyond like one particular movie uh, and some of the movies aren't, aren't that long either and I think I think what Chambers well I can't speak for the man he's long dead uh, he is trying something different. He is experimenting, and maybe it's just not something he wants to write later on. I don't know, but uh, for an experiment, the repair of reputations is exceedingly well done. Mm. Yeah. So I got reminded by by the story and talk of the yellow sign. Uh, by something that I read by Lovecraft and I was thinking to myself, oh, you know, did they know each other or something? Or was that just a reference? And I found it. It was in The Whisper in Darkness. Uh, here's the ex uh, excerpt. I found myself faced by names and terms that I had heard elsewhere in the most hideous of connections. Yugov, Grey Cthulhu, Shagota, Yark Sofov, Rylev, Nilahotep, Azatov, Haster, Yain, Leng. The Lake of Hali, the Theomar, the Yellow Sign, Mul Kathus, Bran, and the Magnum Inominadum, and was drawn back, uh, back through nameless eons in inconceivable dimensions, the worlds of elder outer entity at which the crazed offer of the Necronomicon had only gazed in the vaguest way. There in a, is a whole secret cult of evil men, a man of your mystical erudition with the understanding. I may link them with Haster and the Yellow Sign, devoid to the purpose of tracking them down and injuring them on behalf of the monstrous powers from other dimensions. Mm. So Lovecraft, at least, uh, you know, we know he read this, these stories. He mentions oh, the, sure. the mean, King in Yellow's... For sure, man, because... Mm -hmm. Because there, there's so much, it, they're so similar in in atmosphere, I would say. Mm. Well, if you yeah. read um, Lovecraft's <laughs> essay on supernatural horror in literature, uh, he wrote a long literary study of horror, and uh, I'm sure he mentions Chambers. We should the... go read that <clears throat> treatise. Uh, uh, so I also remember that there was like I think in 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 Cthulhu's mythos uh, in Lovecraft's work so he's he's a half brother to Cthulhu and he is the offspring of Yoxafov and dear viewers dear listeners we have uh, seen a spawn of Yoxafov before in um in the in the story mm. of uh, the of the Dunwich Horror, mm. so unknowingly we have already met someone connected to the King in Yellow, ever before hearing his name. Now, mm -hmm. if that's not in the you know um, in the spirit of the story, I don't know what is. And also on my King in Yellow down below here, there's a quotation from H. P. Lovecraft. Achieves notable heights of cosmic fear, H.P. Lovecraft. <laughs> it sounds like something he would say after eating some cereal. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. I guess. Certain... I guess. Uh, I guess we can probably say H.P. Lovecraft is a fan of Chambers and The King in Yellow, and yeah. pay tribute to him, or rip him off, if you want to be unkind. Mm. I mean, everyone is ripping somebody off. Yeah. yeah. Literature is a kind of river, isn't it? And every author is a sort of... That, uh, that reminds me of uh, Lawrence of Arabia. The Turks pay me a golden treasure, yet I am poor, for I am a river to my people. And then they all scream. Good oh. stuff. Mm. Um, yeah, so here's, a, here's an interesting point. We know that there is a king in yellow. Uh, other three stories, right? Uh, uh, until it gets to romances. Yeah, 
mm-hmm. that that do lo- are you know loosely connect to this. But let's say we don't. And Chambers comes over to us. You know, we're drinking tea with him. Oh, yes, good sir. Oh, very good. <laughs> Uh, and then he goes, yeah, so you jolly chaps, have you read my story? You know, what did you think? And we're all like, it's a, it's a doozy, you know, wowzers. He's like, yeah, well, you know, like, can I do a sequel? What would we recommend him? You know, what would you say to Chambers if he came to you, you know? He'd be like, look, what do we do next? I don't have anything to tell him except to keep mm. on doing what he's doing. Mm. It's a secret sauce right. to this. The secret sauce to this kind of uh, uh, this kind of stories is not easily emulatable. And mm. I mean, in my opinion, what Lovecraft tried to do was to ape Chambers, but he didn't quite succeed in getting. Just a, that exact view. Not not should he, because he's not Chambers. But what the the King in Yellow is fully Chambers. I feel he's <laughs> it's just one of those kind of works where. It, the, only the author can do it, and sometimes the author can't do it after the first one. Mm-hmm. All right. What about you, Robert? Mm. Chambers came to you and said, "Hey, man, we're uh, we're struggling with the second one. What do you think? What what can we put in there? What do you say?" Gosh, that is hard. That is hard. You know, I find it hard enough to write my own fiction, <laughs> let alone somebody else. Are you gonna let Chambers down like X did? Yeah, You're gonna give him something. Yeah. Uh, well, I'd I'd say um, perhaps try a different a different geographical setting. Uh, you because... know what that is that that was my idea as well that i'd give to chambers i'd mm-hmm. say folk make a prequel if you can't make a sequel make a prequel and then you'll think of a sequel right and the f- prequel would be the tribulations of the guy who wrote the king in yellow right that's what i would mm-hmm. uh, give him i'd be like look you don't tell anybody at the end that he writes the king in yellow you call it something else you have him go through trials, you know, he's got his horrible life, and then in the end, you know, he sees something, something terrible and magnificent. And then when they take him away, after they find that he has, you know, destroyed all those who have wronged him, he has already sent out a parcel, a copy, and the last moment of the story, right, is someone receiving it in Paris for the printing books. With a bunch of money and a name, hmm. the king in yellow. That's that. You just raised a point. I, which in my own lack of uh, my my own ability not to ask important questions never ceases to amaze me. I just realised that we don't. Do we know who wrote the king in yellow in a court in in the story? Do we know who wrote this the fictional king in yellow? I don't think we do. Do we? It's no, 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 not in the. I mean, not in the one I read. I don't know no, if we no, know it later. Of, yeah. No. I suppose uh, that makes the, sense. The you know. the identity of the author, at least in the repair of reputations, is unknown. Hmm. So that that would be my advice. To, to I mean, if this was a Reddit post, I'll be downvoting you all the way. Well, uh, mm-hmm. what's it called? I'm... <laughs> I would care about it <laughs> as much as any other Reddit comment. <laughs> um, all right. Um, in the end, the story of um, the trials and turbulations of uh, Hildred, the king of America, gets a 9 out of 10 for me. Mm. Same here, I think 9 out of 10 sounds good. 9 yeah. out of 10 is a good score. Yeah. Mm. I, wow. I, will, nine, nine, nine. I, I, will, I will say something, though. And that is, this, this, the stories like this, The King in Yellow, to be honest, on some level, I actually uh, am with Nikki. I don't like 
inconclusive stories. I don't like stories where the narrative, na- the the details are all over the place, and I can't follow them. And normally, I would have rated stories like this very low, but the repair of reputations is just not the same. Mm. It's done really well. The 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 writing alone elevates it. Sorry, go on, Robert. Mm-hmm. I think I'll change my mind and give it a 10 out of 10 because I can't see anything wrong with it, actually. Um, I mean, in its own terms. honestly, I, 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 I tend towards Robert's position more, but more so I, I am not giving a perfect score only just because there's always something that could be better. Just I mean, I'll, I'll tell you why, why it's not a 10 out of 10 for me. I think really you know and you can download me as much as you want register um, <laughs> i think a sentence or two to at least gleam what's in the king in yellow or the description of Haster or something like something just a little bit more is missing and then it would be a 10 out of 10. i'm not asking for like three paragraphs of the and then on page 69 you know there was this and this right Hmm. something it, small it, to- yeah. it i think it is a good thing that the king in yellow is as short as it is not just not just the fact that the repair reputations uh i mean just like there's only four stories where the king in yellow is loosely alluded to and they are sort of connected to each other i i think if it went further it would have been like jj abrams with his mystery box like lost nothing ever gets resolved and it gets old just like you said but because it is so short it does work mm. yeah you could have at least right. given the isbn number of the king in yellow you know, but, you know. <laughs> all right i mean uh, it's free uh and by the way dear viewers uh, one last thing before we when this might be the last time that you see me uh where i'm currently sitting i uh, will probably have a new setting and uh, next time we record for i am moving uh, so say goodbye to these hollowed walls that I've heard <laughs> the, the tales all the way from episode one uh, till now. Till I think mm. this might be 62, 63, I, I'm not really sure. But uh, yeah, um, from, from, <laughs> from the room to you, hope you enjoy it tonight. Um, and really read the story i think you will enjoy it it's so highly, easily fi- uh, highly you know. recommended yes mm, it's highly so easy to find it yeah it's a treasure man this is a gem all right um like and subscribe and all that stuff and have a great day yeah thank you for watching bye bye